Hi, I'm Joanna Vicente, Executive Director and Co-Head of TIFF. And I'm Cameron Bailey, Artistic Director and Co-Head of TIFF. As you join us today, we encourage you to reflect on the land that you're on, who the traditional keepers of the land are, what the treaty relationship is, or if it's unceded territory. We're located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. The territory is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We're grateful to work on this land. Thank you so much for joining us for the 45th Toronto International Film Festival. We're not the only ones celebrating a special anniversary this year. A few festival favorites have also reached important milestones and we're bringing them back to you in our series, The Best of TIFF Reunions, presented by Bell. From a 4K drive-in screening of Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket to the first ever TIFF People's Choice Award winner, Girlfriends, from director Claudia Vile. To help us celebrate, we're reuniting key members of the cast and crew virtually, like Aronofsky himself, to discuss Requiem for a Dream, which it's hard to believe turns 20 this year. Audiences are invited to join the conversation and watch the films along with us on Bell Media's Crave. These great films are an example of cinema's power to push limits, to draw tears, spark laughter, and to bring us together. But in order for them to do all of these, they must be seen. And right now, TIFF is struggling to bring the life-changing experiences of film to audiences. As a not-for-profit organization, TIFF has been affected by the global health pandemic. A few months ago, we launched our For the Love of Film Fund to ensure that we continue to bring these vital stories to you each September and year-round. If you're able, please visit tiff.net slash loveoffilm to make a donation of any size. And know that just by purchasing a ticket, you're supporting us and helping to share the power of film. A sincere thank you to our lead sponsor, Bell, and our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa for their steadfast commitment, as well as our major public supporters, the Government of Ontario, Telefilm Canada, and the City of Toronto for their continued support. And thank you all for supporting TIFF. We hope you enjoy your festival. Welcome to Best of TIFF Reunions presented by Bell reuniting creators and collaborators from now classic films that have screened at past editions of the festival and at TIFF Bell Lightbox year round. My name is Kiva Reardon and I'm the lead programmer of Contemporary World Cinema. Today, we are thrilled to celebrate the legacy of Claudia Wilde's girlfriend, also known as the first ever TIFF People's Choice Award winner from 1978. And we couldn't be happier to have director Claudia Wilde and star Melanie Mirant joining us right here. Um, I would like to say a sincere thank you to our lead sponsor, Bell, for their continued support, and also a giant thank you to you, our audience, for joining us. As an organization still impacted by COVID, we need the support of folks like you so that we can continue to present films to future generations. And Claudia, Melanie, thank you so much for being here. It's We really thank appreciate you. it. And, um, well, okay, well, we begin with, as I said off the top, uh, it's a really special film for TIFF because you were the, the first ever TIFF People's Choice Award winner, the award decided by the people. Um, and I'm wondering wow. if you have any memories of, of, that, of that win from, from 1978. <laughs> um, <laughs> should, we do, should we do word association? <laughs> no, <it's laughs> memories. No. Um... <laughs> Well, was it really, it was really the first, it wasn't the first year of TIFF, right? But it was the first year there was a People's Choice Award? Yeah, so you're, yeah, it was the first, the first oh. ever to, to be, uh, to inaugurate that prize, which is now a real center stone uh, or centerpiece of, of, the, of the festival. Wow, that's amazing. What other films won since then? Oh my God, okay, you're really flipping the script on me here. This is supposed to be about- Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm so, all right, all right. <laughs> Don't no, worry, I, do know, but, I mean, uh, the reason why I was bringing it up is because audiences now are so familiar with this idea of, you know, the girl in the big city trope, which um, is a term that I pulled from a piece. And, yeah, it, it was um, author Katie Go from Little White Lies had written extensively about it. You know, 
stories that follow women and their decisions, essentially living in a big city. Right, and it's something right. I think folks take for granted now, but at the time that was really revolutionary. It was, you know, before Nora Ephron, before CW's Girlfriends, before mm -hmm. Lena Dunham's Girls, we now have is Sex in the City, Broad City, I May Destroy You. They all kind of come from that lineage. And I'm wondering what, what that legacy means for you and whether you reflect on that now. Claudia was the first person to do it. She was the first one to put together a project where it was the, you know, the early 70s. And, you know, look, we all grew up in the in like the 50s where the fathers were going out and making all the money and the mothers were homemakers. And right. We grew up knows best. That. And it was like, why can't us girls have that. Why can't we have the exciting lives? Why are we the ones that are stuck at home with the blue and pink toilets and sinks and mint green ovens and everything? You right, know, right. It was, but even more. It's, it, it, yeah, sorry, exactly. I mean, it was that. But but when there were women in movies, they were like Katie Hepburn, or they were you know like Grace Kelly, or I mean, they were very sophisticated, very beautiful, mostly very waspy. You know, they were kind of leading ladies in a kind of grand sense. There wasn't, I, watching movies, I had never seen myself in movies anywhere. Sometimes, of course, in, in, in especially in TV, there was, you know, what I like to call the Rota legacy, which is the, the sidekick, the best friend, right? Who's kind of the wisecracking one, is more ethnic. Uh, usually a little overweight or, you know, but not the perfect figure. I mean, you know, if, if anything, there was that person, you know, uh, Gail Storm. I, can, I seem to remember her from a, a TV show where she was, for, you can drop that part. I don't remember if I've got that right. But, there, you know, I just never could see myself in the movies. And it, it's not that it was that conscious like, I don't see myself in the movies. I'm going to make a movie about somebody like me. It wasn't, it was just like a survival tactic. You know, making the movie was just a way of um, feeling real, feeling valid, feeling okay, feeling like you belong in the world. I mean, I think it's, it, I think it operated on that unconscious level, but I think the legacy of it was that it made has made other women, young women, women of all ages feel like they don't have to be the leading lady to to feel they exist, to feel their life has meaning, you know. Um, and, and I think that's the, maybe a bit of the legacy. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I was I was also thinking when you were referencing Mary Mary Tyler Moore, I had you know had heard you speak about that show um, in, mm -hmm. in previous interviews, and it made me think of of TV. I mean, all the shows that I just listed, and and Melanie, you've gone on to direct extensively for television um, on shows like Jane the Virgin, Be Little Liars, Tell Me You Love Me, Switch at Birth, and so, like shows that really center on women. Um, and I'm wondering if you feel is there more room in television for this idea of the the imperfect woman um the you know the Rhonda not the Mary Tyler Moore well I think now there is I mean look Lena Dunham did it with girls you know she was her character was like the Susan Weinblatt of girlfriends she was a little more ethnic a little overweight whatever she wasn't that waspy pretty girl that we're Claudia was talking about you know but yeah, so for sure there's room. I mean, there's definitely room and there are shows being done now like that. But at the time, you know, Girlfriends it really, really was a first. Claudia was a, a, a pioneer, a path maker. A, look, she was a, Claudia, you know, it's crazy. And I know I told you this years ago, but I saw a picture mm -hmm. of you when you were with your camera, when you were shooting mm -hmm. the Shirley MacLaine documentary. Right, right. And I saw this young, fabulous woman, this holding this camera, and I was like, oh my God, I want to be like her. And I went out and I bought a 35 millimeter camera and I learned really? how to use it. Yeah, I saw this picture. I didn't know this. Oh and I God. started taking headshots of actors and, you know, like to earn extra money. And when I went up for my audition for Girlfriends, I couldn't believe in a million years that I was reading for you. It was. Whoa. 
I don't and even I did, remember that. That's and, amazing. And I did, you know, and I was, so I was doing photography, still photography, not shooting like you did, but um, yeah. So, I mean, I still do, but it was this image, it was this image of you. I mean, my father had given me a little box camera when I was nine, but I specifically, right, right. this one shot of you, and I know I still have it and can find it, but Claudia That's was- so crazy. She was a pioneer in, in how she was living her life and what she was doing professionally. She had a company, Cyclops Films, with a partner and Eli. And, and, you know, she was doing great work. And it was a little bit before the whole women's movement and everything that was going on. Yeah. I mean, hey. that all kind of started happening. Oh, no, but sorry, no, you, you go. One of, the reason, one of the reasons that we have so few production stills on Girlfriends is because Melanie was the uh, still photographer for the film. <laughs> Which is like That's just funny. a word of warning. Do not make your lead the still photographer for the film. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, won't be any pictures with her in it. <laughs> well, I'm I'm wondering because there is it's not autobiographical. You said that, but there was that that again, Im autobiographical impulse to sort of you know show see something like you on screen. Right. So, what was exactly. that like then? But for you, Melanie and Claudia, what was it like sort of saying, become me, but also not fully me? Like, what was that What was that process like in terms of embodying Susan and creating the character? Oh, boy. When I met Melanie, I just handed it over. You know, Melanie was Susan by then. And and I, I know that you were kind of looking at me sometimes, for right? A little bit for, like, hints about stuff. But... I mean, one of the beauties of just casting the right person is that you don't think about that anymore. Right. You I know. did. A, I did a. Um, my first movie was a Paul Mazursky film called Harry and Tonto, and I remember we were on location, and I was always with my little camera, and I was standing by the the camera operator, and I was talking to him and asking him questions, and Paul came up to me and he leaned across the hood of the truck and. He said, you know, Melanie, he says, you could have the best script. He said, you could have the best director of photography. You could have the best director. You could have the best production designer. You could have the best costume designer. He said, but if you didn't cast the lead in your movie right, all of those best, they mean nothing. And He's he, totally right. And I never, I was 21. I never forgot that. It was wild because that's who's in front of the camera, you know, that's who's wearing the clothes. Yeah. That's, that's the person that everybody's gonna care about. Everything hangs, you know, in, for this film, everything hangs on Melanie and her relationships to everybody. I mean, luckily the supporting cast is like amazing, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, Chris, Christopher Gass and Bob Balaban and Anita Skinner and Gina Rojak and Eli Wallach, uh, Eli Wallach and <laughs> Vivica Lindfors and Amy, Right. Amy Wright and, you know, on and on, you know, it's like an amazing cast, but yeah, I, I do Jane believe. Anderson. Jane Anderson. Jane Anderson, yes. Who became a wonderful writer, really wonderful yeah, writer. Yeah, and director, yeah. Yeah, and director, oh great. Right. That's right, yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of other directors were inspired by the film. Lena, it was, it was so interesting because she was working on this idea for girls um when she came to see girlfriends at a screening and i think she said something like wait a minute have you been inside my mind you know like that not not that i had stolen but that somehow the idea that was in her mind that she was just writing the film already existed wow and and, and she was kind of stunned by that and i landed up directing girls which was really great and very sweet of her but um, now I think, you know, there, there's so many more women who are directing. I mean, it's still, the, the numbers are still not good. They're, they're still pretty lousy, but, uh, there has been a, ch a change, I think in, in the last year. Don't you think Melanie? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. A few percentage points, you know, it's, I would, uh, it's, a, I was at a to get go ahead. This is just you an little side bit for what you're saying. I was at the Directors Guild of America. They had a feature director's night, okay? Mm -hmm. 
And I had done the movie, The Babysitter's Club. So that was like mm -hmm. 30 years ago at this point. So, but for four or five years, you're on the list if you directed a feature that you mm -hmm. get. To so I went to this dinner and I was sitting with Betty Thomas and Amy, Amy, who did Valley Girl, you know, Amy Heckerling. Betty Amy Heckerling. Amy Heckerling, me, we're sitting at a table and I was looking around and all the other tables were men. And, but then, the, then I saw some women standing on the sides and I said, wow, I said, they're not, oh, and the, this was a dinner where you couldn't bring your, your spouses. So the men couldn't bring their wives, you know, that was just if they were directors. And I was looking around and I said, I know there aren't a lot of women, but, but there are, there are other women. Look guys. And I pointed and I think Amy said, Melanie, they're the caterers. Oh my God. Right. So it, was, of course. it was pretty much only us of at the course. table. There was like three right, of us. Right. Right. Wow. And Martha Coolidge and Martha Coolidge. There was five of us. Yeah. Right. It, was, it was ridiculous. So it's come a long way. I was at a TV. It has come a long way. Episodic night, and it was tons and tons of women. So that was a big difference from that first dinner. Wow. Well, that's a huge difference. When I was directing um, my second movie, It's My Turn in Hollywood, um, and I, I was admitted into the academy at that point when I, and Elaine May and I were the third and fourth women admitted into the academy as directors. The first two being Ida Lupino and Dorothy Arzner. Oh my, that 30, was it. Oh my 30 God. years earlier, Ida Lupino had been admitted in 1950 and Dorothy Arzner in the 40s sometime. And we were the only four women wow. directors in the academy. Yeah. There was, I, I, I mean, I, I know there's more now because all of us have lobbied so hard that any woman who's got two features should fucking be allowed, you know, but uh, it has changed, but just because there are more movies. Yeah. So I, when I was, when I was rewatching the film, I, something that really stuck out to me this time was, um, again, I'm quoting from that little white lies piece. Um, and, they describe oh, it as up. oh, it's quite, it's very good. Um, and they write, mm -hmm. Girlfriends was one of the first films to capture the nuances and complexities of female friendship and fighting and frightening loneliness, and sorry, and the frightening loneliness of freedom. And that part really struck me this time rewatching it. Maybe it's because I'm really lonely because it's COVID. But I also think that that aspect, the, the frightening loneliness of freedom is still really unexplored um, in stories about women. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just talk about that aspect of it, where that impulse came from. Came from my life, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, um, living alone. Um, I mean, the film is, is autobiographical in the sense that girlfriend after girlfriend and um, my, both my sisters all got married you know, just one after I was the last woman standing basically of my community. And, and you were the oldest of your sisters, right? And I was the oldest of my sisters. Right. Like I'm eight years younger than one and six years older than the other. And, you know, they were both married. My parents were like looking at me, you know, like it was, um, you know, it was hard to go home. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, it was lonely. It was, it, you know, at that time, because people really functioned in couples. I mean, I still think there's a divide between single people and married people. But right now, it seems like the greater divide is between people with children and people who don't have children. That, that seemed like, seems like the bigger dividing line. But at the time when I was single, it you know, it was very hard to be included in the social life of people, of couples. Right. All of a sudden you were, you know, so if all your friends and sisters got married, then like, who are you supposed to hang out with? It was a different, I mean, it seems odd now talking about it, but because I have a lot of friends who are single and they come over and, you know, not right now, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was, very, it was very different. I mean, look, Girlfriends was made in the like 74, 75 or, or mm -hmm. 70, around there. And it was yeah, still, 75. Mm -hmm. it was still coming yeah. off of the 60s. You know, the 60s, right. if anybody got divorced, I remember when I was 
in the 60s as a teenager, if anybody got divorced, the, the moms were talking about it like it was a catastrophe, like it was mm -hmm. scandalous. You know, oh, the That's right. whoever got, we're getting a divorce. It was like, what? I mean, everybody was coupled up. Everybody. That was Claudia at the time. And it was, yeah, it was sort of skirting that time or maybe moving out of it a little bit, but uh, it was very much all coupled up. And, and, and we thought that for sure. And I was also thinking about the idea of the marriage plot, you know, which is like started with Jane Austen and then basically became the rom-coms that we know now in film. Right, right. And, and this film is still so subversive in upending that. You know, I love the line when Susan's like, I was going through a bad, or like I was coming out of a bad breakup and talking about, you know, splitting with a roommate and how those relationships are so impactful in our lives. And I was wondering, was this, again, I know it came from your life, but was there any part of you that was kind of like, screw that, I don't want to have to follow that A to B, the, you know, story trope or fall into that genre even when you were making it? Right, right. I, I do think, I, I do think it, the, the film um, did come out of some, need to defend my life, you know, um, and that I didn't have to be with a man to have value, you know, um, and um, so, I mean, I think there's, there's certainly some of that in there. Um, but you're, you're right, Jane Austen went, you know, there's, there is a direct line from Jane Austen to rom-coms. I mean, my next, the next feature I made, my, it's my turn, um, ended with Kate, the protagonist, played by Jill Clayburgh, who is alone at the end of the film. But they insisted, Ray Stark insisted on having like a, what, what was, the, whatever was the FedEx at the time, a special delivery to her, faculty, her faculty offices where she, where she was teaching as she was coming out of uh, a, a kind of a, a little gift, an ice cream cone from this potential romantic partner, Michael Douglas, she had met over the weekend. And so they needed to just tip the scales just a little bit to say, oh, he might be coming back in to the story. Oh. Right? So just that little special delivery of this present. Like, Columbia Pictures just like needed that to, to release the film. Wow, they couldn't just have her be by herself. Right. Um, that for me, I mean, I stood up to it as much as I could, but Ray Stark was a major mogul at the time. And um, between him and the studio, there were, you know, there, it, it, it was impossible to fight it. And it was one of the main reasons I decided not to try and make another movie in LA in in that system it was more important well what was more important to me was telling stories and I love directing theater I discovered television around then and, and gradually over the next few years all the fantastic writers went into tv right. and I mean and it was like a golden age of television you know starting with you know early on when my kids were pregnant I was directing things like Cagney and Lacey and uh, I forget what else um but later, you know, 30 something in my so-called life. And, you know, all the great writers who were working then just became more meaningful than and a, a lot of them were playwrights. They were New York playwrights that were exactly. then that's what was, was going on that were in the exactly, 80s, exactly. 90s television. Yeah. Right. Right. A lot of good writers. Also, it was also just hard being in LA as a woman, as a single woman, then, as a single woman of some power, not much, but like some power because, um, you know, I was either somebody that they wanted to hire or somebody they wanted to fuck, you know, but either way, I was sort of an object some, that you had to deal with in one way or, or other. So it was not a, like a, a fun place to be socially, emotionally. Do, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you, yeah. Right? You were a commodity. You were a commodity. You were either, oh, we want to hire her to do a picture, or you were objectified as, you know, by as fuckable, right? 
Yeah, I, I don't know I'm, if that's really I'm, clear. Am I am I no, clear at all? Does that make sense? Honestly, am I saying I that accurately? <laughs> Melanie, tell me. You can say better what I I'm trying to say. I don't know. No, I it think is. it's perfectly clear. Yeah, and and I think so relatable to you know a lot of a lot of women as well. Um, but Melanie, I was all, I was wondering, you know, the way Claudia was saying there was that kind of impulse to defend her life in making the film. I'm wondering if there was any kind of I suppose like really personal connection like that in playing the role. Um, if you had encountered a role like that before, even um, when you were reading for parts and reading scripts. No, I think Claudia was right. I mean, Susan Weinblatt was representative of Claudia's life, of my life. You know, we, we were just not the blonde, blue-eyed, whatever, everybody, the waspy right. girl that everybody was looking for. And I had been exactly. playing, the parts I had been playing even were best friend parts up to that point, you know? Right, was, right, was, exactly. That was, that was my role. I, I Through my career, I played best friends to some gigantic, gigantic people. But this was an wow, opportunity. Wow, you did, didn't you? Yeah, but this was an opportunity where the movie was about the best friend, you know, the one that that didn't get married, the one that you don't ever, you push out of the way when you take a picture, you know, and I could completely 100% relate to that. So I, 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 I remember I was ecstatic when I got that part because Susan it was so close to, to my life and my experience. And I yeah. think what the film did is that it made us all see that the sidekick could be a protagonist. Right. You know, that we were all protagonists in our own lives. So somebody as compelling and funny and interesting as Melanie, who actually becomes, as she becomes more herself, becomes more and more also beautiful in, in an amazing kind of from the inside out way. Um, it, it, I think it, it just sent a powerful message to people, you know, to be yourself, be mm -hmm. true to yourself, you know? Yeah, and therefore, therefore more amazing that we won the Toronto Film Festival People's yeah. Choice Awards. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, and you know. and the, the, the point I was making earlier about LA as being sort of like a commodity, you know, either to hire or fuckable, I, it's not that that commodity doesn't exist in New York too, but much less. There are many more gradations, you know, oh. of possibilities of relationships uh, in, in in New York. You know, you, they're they're friends. They're, they're, not everybody's in the business. You know, being in right. LA was like being in Detroit if you made if you were a car maker. Right. You know, yeah. that's the industry dominated your social life in LA. So that's why it was that binary, you know, whereas in New York, yeah. what you did for a living didn't dominate your life and doesn't actually dominate your life to this day, which is one of the reasons I, I enjoy living there. Right. Well, I, I'm glad you brought up New York as well, because I was, again, doing when I was you know, doing some research for this, um, you know, along with our, our Chip Cinema Tech team um, as well as that um, Richard Brody, when he was writing with the film, points out that, um, you know, it's capturing this new dynamic of, of, you know, this friendship between two women, but, and I'm quoting here, but it also catches the last days of an old New York. And, you know, I think that can border on a kind of extreme nostalgia or sort of, you know, idolizing. But I, I also think that there's, there is something to consider in that um, the film is kind of a document to New York, or as people love to say, it's, it's a character in the film as well. It has um, a character, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the locations, you know, were very, um, I mean, people were very generous. Like, for instance, O.K. Harris, the, the gallery. Oops, it just, something just happened. Can you see me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there, yeah. okay. So, like, um, people were very generous with locations. And O.K. Harris was the first gallery downtown. In Soho. In Soho. It was on West Broadway. And it was started by Ivan Karp. And, you know, I just walked in there one day and said, you know, I'm making this movie for $80,000 because at that point we hadn't gotten the 60 privately. So, you know, and it's about the star for blah, 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 blah. Could we, could we shoot here? Um, it'd probably be half a day, maybe a day. And he said, sure. And he didn't even charge us anything. You know, and, and I mean, that was amazing. It was a beautiful gallery. And so, I mean, people were very um, kind of, generous um 
at the time, people were very proud of New York. Like for instance, the unions were amazing. Um, there, it wasn't, there wasn't an independent film movement in New York at the time. And I had all these wonderful actors like Melanie and Chris Gaston, Bob Balaban and so forth, who wanted to do the movie and they were all SAG. And I, and so I, I went to the union and I said, look, there's no way I can pay the 500 or whatever number of dollars it was minimum weekly. I just don't have it on this budget. So what can we do? Cause your membership would like to do the movie. And, and then I, I proposed to them, what if I get, what if I pay half of that, like 250 a week? And then if I'm able to sell the movie and I know, I'm sure I'll be able to sell it. I mean, I was cockier than, than I am now. Um, then I'll pay twice that afterwards. And they said, great, great. That sounds great. Let's do that. I mean, you know, I didn't have a lawyer at that point. I just went to the union. And every union was was helpful in this way, and as, as were people with locations. So, I mean, it was a new era in New York where people were um, just feeling, uh, there was a lot of creativity. And, you know, the, the whole new parts of the city were, were being reclaimed, like Soho. You know, there was just some amazing old buildings that had been there forever that were turning it, turning into lofts. and And, it was just a very exciting time. But it was happening then. Like there weren't really any stores. There was okay. No. And artists were living. They were taking these old warehouse buildings and, you know, living in these kind of crappy loft spaces. And But they had right. But New York. And the stairways oh, were oh, like falling through. You know, you have to like take oh. the, the freight elevator that you have to sort of manage yourself to get up or down. Or somebody yeah. had to come down to get you. Yeah, it was really it was empty. Like living in the wilds, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're right. It was it was it capturing New York at a certain time. And then the other thing which is amazing is, you know, no smartphones, no none of the technology, you know, like Christopher Guest character comes over and eats the shrimp, eats Susan's shrimp right. with the phone, you know, like it's, right. like, it's stuff right. that, that wouldn't have even happened now because Exactly. Leaving, yeah, exactly. yeah, leaving your number on an answering machine. Like, I'll leave your number here. You leave your number on mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right, exactly. Such a different era. You know, people actually had to sort of reach out. And that makes for better drama. Right. Cell phones are kind of anti-drama. Right. I mean, I don't right. know about that. <laughs> well, I mean... You know, I can't tell you how many scenes like, I've seen in, in films where they're talking oh, on the cell phone. Really it's like, cinema, for sure, yeah, yeah. yeah I bet yeah. my personal drama on my phone, but we don't have to get about it. Right. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. There's yeah. plenty of personal drama. Social media, forget about it. Okay. <laughs> well, I also I guess it was 2019, I believe, that the film was selected for preservation, uh, which was mm -hmm. last year. Oh, my gosh, yeah. That was, yes. 2019. It was last year. Um, it was also programmed at, at the Tiff Cinematheque by Amanda Brayson last year as well. Um, right. And then, of course, recently it's just been announced that you'll have a Criterion release and a 4K restoration. Um, so, first of all, congratulations! That's thank huge you. News. Yeah. It, um, and can, can, what was it? What was it like hearing hearing that news? Well, I was kind of bowled up by the Library of Congress, you know, picking it as you know, one of, one of their films, I mean, along with, a, you know, I mean, you know, it's like being in a time capsule to be discovered later. And that kind of blew my mind because they're, they're up to now, there have not been many independent films in the library of Congress. So, um, um, and, and uh, the, the same thing with Criterion, you know, I, I was just, knocked out i mean just knocked out that they that they wanted it um it is kind of what's stunning about the film is that um each it keeps being rediscovered it's sort of like the little film you know the little train that could or whatever a little engine that you know could. the little engine that could right you know it's like everybody feels like they discovered it right like it didn't exist before, but also somebody discovers it and they write about it, you know, or they model a series on it, or they are started making films because of it, or whatever. It 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 has, you know, it has its own life. And that's kind of completely separate from me, but is very gratifying. 
you know, yeah. it's very gratifying that whatever it is that we did, you know, keeps lives on and affects people. Right. It's still a great, great, yeah. It's still Both really emotionally and cre creatively. Yeah, yeah. Still very. To do their own work. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I can really say that it was the tip audiences that discovered it. <laughs> it was. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> Toronto is an amazing city. Really, the tip audiences can really lay a claim to that. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Absolutely. I mean, no, I'm, I'm tip teasing, audiences but I are, more, are a little more like European audiences. Right. You know, and that they're real cinephiles. They really dig film. They're not in, 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 in the way that when you go to Europe or, or you screen in France or something that, you know, it's like it's a, it's a really an art form and you're being taken very seriously as an artist. And, and that is somewhat true in Toronto, whereas in America, you're again more of a commodity. Right. Can you make more good films? Can you make more money for them? You right. know, right. So it was a, it was a real honor. Uh, to be, to, to get that award at TIFF. It's really special. Whoops. And it also, um, shooting in Toronto is so much fun. Do you hear music? Maybe it's my phone. Just ignore it. I don't oh, know. Okay. <laughs> well, here you go. It's all, it's all, it's all technology. It's okay. Um, we are, I am getting our, our digital signal that we're, you know, we're, we're, running running out of time in our in our little zoom pods um but i want to thank you both so much for for joining us here today for this q a congratulations again on the criterion release um and yeah as we were saying off the top you know this girlfriends has been such uh such a touch point for so many writers directors um and that strong slate of girls in the big city narrative um so we do want to mention that if you are tuning in from canada you can find some of those titles like Girls, Broad City, <clears throat> I May Destroy You in Sex in the City on Bell Media's Grave. And you can watch Girlfriends and then watch the, you know, the legacy in present day as well. So uh, Claudia and Melanie, thank you again. And thank you to thank everyone. Thank you. For watching. Thank you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you for, thank you for having us. It's very cool. For sure. Thanks.